All the world's human life depends on the fertility of a thin sheet of the Earth's topsoil. It covers one-tenth of the Earth's total surface, forming a storehouse of plant nutrients, which is on average only about 15 centimetres deep. It takes about a thousand years to build just a few centimetres, which wind and water can remove in a few months, particularly if there's no natural support system to protect and develop it. It's what's in here, in the soil, that determines the quality and the quantity of a farm's output. Doesn't matter how good the genetics of the plants or the animals, in the end, it's the quality of the soil which controls the quality of hay, like this, grain, fleeces, beef, vegetables and fruit that feed on the soil. The old question of diversity all over again. The more diverse the characters, the workers in the soil, then there's a much greater chance of good crumb structure and at the same time the ability to absorb and hold on to moisture. In short, damn good dirt. How healthy a soil now is under the, the few uh, remaining trees that we've got left, I think. And our soil has been so shallow, so fragile, they depended a lot on the leaves and the bark off the trees uh, rotting down into the soil and building the, the, the soil up. Yeah. And I'm, I'm sure our, our healthiest uh, soil now is left just underneath the drip line of the trees. The better heart you can have the soil in, the, the more that we'll get back out of it, which is when the classic of what Bruce said before, where the, where the forest or the trees were before, that soil was in good heart because, and that was shown to him by the fact that the way his new pasture grew so well in it. So I suppose our aim is to get all of our soil in that sort of, in that sort of heart. Mm. The soils are our bank balance, but uh, we really haven't uh, even thought about them, I don't think, up the, to this stage. And uh, through Potter and the collecting up of all these ideas, it, it's broadened our horizons one hell of a lot. And soils is just another as aspect that uh, we thought we knew a bit about. Now we've got into it. We know very little and we just don't know which way to go. And if you've got a native pasture of kangaroo grass and and uh, you know a few other medics and what have you, you'll be in our country, you'll run about one sheep to the acre. And if you've got an improved pasture like we have now, highly improved with a good balance of clovers and grasses, you'll, you'll be running four and a half or five, and and cutting more production off those sheep as well. The natural support system that you integrate into your farm directly affects your production by both protecting and developing your farm soils. It's why there's so much emphasis on dividing your property into land types to tailor the management of each distinct production area. It's why a vegetation strategy aims to stabilise the tops of the ridges to reduce runoff and wind erosion, to attract fauna to help control pests and to filter salty areas. The farmland plan aims to develop your topsoil through careful soil preparation and by diversifying the species which grow in the soil. The preparation of each unit can be determined by the quality of the soil, the depth of the topsoil, the amount of compaction you have to deal with, and what you have to add to balance the mineral content. The soil's fertility depends on diversity. So, when you're growing crops, whilst there's single species each growth season, vary the species with a well-planned rotation. One of the most exciting adjustments we've made in Australian farming in the last 20 years is the amazing range of new crops that we've started to grow. So it's not just wheat, oats and barley anymore, but things like triticale and lupins and linseed, field peas, field beans, soybeans, a whole host of them. Actually, a soil's fertility and health depends on diversity of crops and pastures. And that's where a good rotation can really help. Brian and Max Head have developed a simple but effective rotation for their barley crops in the Wimmera in northwestern Victoria. Whilst they haven't replanned their farm, 
Their priorities with soil quality and care of their land are sustaining excellent results on dirt that's been growing wheat for over a hundred years. Sounds a long time, but really isn't in the soil's life. We treat our medics as a crop. We sow them at 10 to 12 pound an acre in autumn. We plough them in in late spring. It lays fallow over the summer period. We sow our wheat the following May. We harvest wheat December. We burn the wheat stubble again early autumn and sow back to medics. It's basically a two year rotation. That's really what it all is. It's just medics, wheat, medics, wheat. It's a medic Med fallow. Medics on a very short term so that you uh, get the nitrogen, you get the uh, organic matter and uh, we disc it in and that way we get our uh, fertility levels up and the wheat crop's just like an ordinary wheat crop that anybody else sows. We use a minimum of chemicals and uh, we need to use the necessary fertilisers and trace elements that, are, uh, that have to be used in this country for uh, cereal crops. In very different conditions, Sam Jericho has adapted a cereal rotation with stock to the very dry, sandy plains of Eyre Peninsula. I have um, a rotation which is based on a three-year rotation of cereal cropping. The, as soon as the stubbles are available, they are fed out by the sheep. Those stubbles then are planted down to oats and medics. The sheep then follow into the paddocks, which have had the oats and the medic on them the previous year. And um, those paddocks then become the ones which are chemically fallowed for the cereal crop the following year. And the stubble paddocks are the ones which provide the hay cut or the oat crop so that there's really a a distinct three-year rotation in the agricultural land. The 1989 season was good with above average rains, so Sam trialled this sunflower crop on some of his poorer soils. Well, I was, I was looking for an alter alternative crop on that poor sand, and I knew that there was enough moisture there this particular year to grow a summer crop. So I tried sunflowers, and if we can get a summer growing crop rather than put our sheep on that sandy soil, we may be better off. In stark contrast, Richard Speed on the rich self-mulching soils of the Darling Downs has a strip cropping operation. Well, I've got about three different rotations on the place, but uh, on the main section of the place, we'd probably plant sorghum, followed by maize, possibly by sunflowers, and then double crop back into barley, triticale, maybe wheat. And if we want to plant chickpeas as a legume, we've got to change that rotation. So it's sorghum, sunflowers, maize, and then chickpeas. Essentially, strip cropping was a system devised in response to the constant flooding that the area experienced. It was eroding the topsoil via wide gullies. If cropping is the best way to use the land, I can't think of a better way to do it than strip cropping. In some areas of Australia, I'm certain that it'd be more or less a waste of time. But definitely on this self-mulching black soil and where you have an overland flow from, you know, a creek that spreads out onto the plain, that's, that's definitely where you have to use it. As Richard Speed says, Strip cropping mightn't be appropriate for many other parts of Australia. But his work, as with Sam Jericho's and the Head Brothers, is a good example of tailoring a crop strategy to the land type, with the soil's protection and fertility given top priority. Where the land is compacted from stock or continual ploughing, the thick crust is a solid barrier to growth, and seedlings can't emerge. The soil structure is broken down and the water doesn't drain through. So you're limited to shallow rooted pastures or stunted crops. Jack Balance has tackled a pretty tough part of the Mallee and through deep cultivation has managed to shatter the compaction layer 
and he's now reaping the benefits of a much healthier soil. There's a piece of the old hard pound. That's the sort of plant we had before. But uh, in comparing the two, well, it's not hard to visualise where the crop is, where the yield is and where the money is. These plants have got a huge root system on them. Even in a very wet year like this, you've got an excellent root system that's never been put under stress yet and had cause to go down, but you know, the vigour of the root is enormous. In fact, these that are plagued with a hard pan, and there's a few of them into the hard pan, but see, they're, they're not doing any good at all. They're not even through three inches of soil. Two or three inches of topsoil is virtually all you have originally, or before the land's cleared because uh, that's the way it is and uh, we're in the process of making soil and making it deeper. Allowing the rain to penetrate the soil effectively by deep tilling it. It's such a costly business that, uh, to do this and so much technology involved and equipment that uh, it's and so much unknown that uh, not many are doing much about it as yet. We've got no organic matter, material in the soil, we haven't got soil. That's the first thing uh, to establish. The, a lot of Mallee farms have been uh, eroded through the technology that they've been in, uh, incited to use. And this has been disastrous in the long term, such as bare fallows, drifting fallows and that sort of thing. Uh, the drift sand cuts the galvanise off the wire. That costs $3,000 a kilometre to replace. Uh, the soil blows to New Zealand or some place between. And that blew up there last summer, yeah. off that fellow paddock. And the roots had come right through and a bit of sand. And it was mostly living on that organic matter. Yeah. If you can't leave the soil better than it was, well, you shouldn't be there. And that's generally the aim of every farmer. But most, most don't have the, the know-how or, or the encouragement to have a go in that area. Generally speaking, there'll be no major compaction problems on the Potter farms around Hamilton. And whilst some people have used a light tine cultivator to aerate the soils, the direct drilling technique has worked pretty well. And a key part of their pasture management has been a renovation program. A large part of the, of the uh, Potter farmland plan has been our pasture uh, renovation. In this instance, we've fenced off one land type on its own. We can now look after this parcel of land. It's a paddock uh, that is uh, quite swampy. It gets wet in winter, so we don't uh, overstock it in winter to, to bog it up. We look after the the pasture when it's too wet. On the other hand, it's a, a, a paddock that hangs on well into the summer. The pasture in here had uh, run down a little, so we've uh, rejuvenated it this year with a sod seeding uh, exercise using the newer uh, species that are now available to farmers. Uh, we've used uh, New Zealand rye grasses, uh, hafer clover, we've also added some strawberry clover down in, in the bottom down there where it uh, uh, should do quite well during the summer. It's part of a five year program that, that we've embarked on where uh, by next autumn will be the fifth year of this program, we'll be uh, completely over the farm uh, freshening up the pastures. It's been some time since uh, they've been uh, rejuvenated but now that the uh, land is fenced into smaller parcels just the one land type, well, we can stock it accordingly now. The more farmers experiment with pasture species, the sooner they'll find what works where. On the north side of the place, the south side, the high country, the low country, different soil types. Eventually, 
they'll develop a natural cycle that fits in with their management, their pasture management. It's not appropriate to give precise formulas for pasture preparation. They'll vary from farm to farm and area to area. Local knowledge, research and some trial and error will lead you to the appropriate mix. It's a matter of tailoring pasture and crop management to the land's capability. For example, at Tamman in Western Australia, Tony York has been planting salt bush on his salty country. The sheep thrive on the plant, and for two months in autumn, he can now carry 70 sheep to the hectare. And autumn used to be the leanest time of the year for pasture feed. Tony's now buying salted land from his neighbours. Just down the road, and still around Tamman, Dennis Chatfield is growing tagasasti on country which used to be really wet. So wet, Dennis says, that it's a bog a duck. Nowadays, the tagasasti grows higher than the sheep. On the other side of Australia, in the Lockyer Valley in Queensland, Charlie and Neville Olm are planting leukina trees. They're stabilising these badly eroded hills and making great cattle feed at the same time. These kinds of clever initiatives were matched on the Potter farms, where on average they lifted production on their salty country from three sheep to the hectare to 10 or 12 head. And that was simply by finding the right mix of salt tolerant grasses for their particular soils. I'm really concerned about soils. It's something that we've been encouraged to think a lot harder about over the last few years. The Potter farmland plan in some people's perception is highlighted trees and that's not necessarily the case and it's, mm. it's taught us at least to think a lot more about our soils yeah. and trees are only part of the answer aren't they? Yeah. yeah and acidification and compaction are two other soil aspects in addition to erosion and salinity that, that really concern, uh, concern us especially acidification and uh, our reliance on on pasture mixes that are, that are adding to our acidification problems at the moment. Clover's been a great boon to us in some respects. It's been a great feeder of our stock. We've tended to think of clover from that point of view, stock health and not soil health. <coughs> it's, uh, it's adding nitrogen to our soil in huge quantities. We need to think about perennial ryegrass or perennial grass balance as well. We need to think about aeration. We need to think about liming. We need to think about a whole lot of things that might alleviate the acidification problem that we're facing. 